Welcome, everyone, to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spill the jams and spill the tea. And we're going to talk about some stuff this week. We're going to talk about some news. We're going to talk about all kinds of stuff. Yes, welcome to Jams and Tea now for the third time. It's our third episode of this new format for our basic music discussions, art discussions, whatever we really feel like on a week-to-week basis, and as well as talking about what's new in the world of music, new songs, new tracks, new album announcements, new everything. We're also going to be having a discussion in the latter half of this episode. We're going to be talking about our favorite lyricists of all time, both in terms of like 20th century lyricists from the sort of earlier, more classic rock or whatever era of popular music, as well as artists, lyricists, writers from the last 20 years from the modern era that we're enamored with. Jake, myself, and Morgan are going to be doing that segment, and we've each picked two lyricists that we love that we're going to be discussing, what makes them great, why we love them, and just kind of generally talking about the art of writing a good song. But before we get to that, let's start with what is newest in the world of music right now. So, You know, January is always a terrible month for album releases, but a great month for album announcements. So we're really eating in the Now episodes in particular at the moment in general, because we had quite a few announcements this week, Uh, a couple of which we were like, we knew were going to happen. We're outright expecting, we've even talked about a little bit, but... I don't know if we were expecting them to happen as quickly as they did. Certainly the national who finally officially announced their new album, first two pages of Frankenstein, which is going to be out, I think in the 28th of April, around about the end of April uh, that was announced this week. And um, we kind of knew that announcement was coming, but one announcement we were hoping for, but weren't expecting so quickly was of course the announcement of the first boy genius album, the record. Ah. Oh. I know, right? Which is going to be dropping, I think that's, I want to say, late March or early April. It's around that time. Uh, March 31st. March 31st, literally, yep. Uh, You can also see a very fun little photo shoot that Phoebe, Julian, and Lucy did where they recreate famous photos of the band Nirvana. Uh, I I highly recommend that. It's quite amusing. Yeah, they did. They recreated that famous Nirvana Rolling Stone album cover when they were all in the suits. And I was just thinking mm-hmm. myself, looking at it, how much uh, Lucy does genuinely just look like Fem Chris Novoselic. Like if you put them <laughs> side by side, it just literally looks like uh, and, Chris and, has and been on Julian HRT. Julian and Phoebe are standing on boxes because they're such tiny women. Yeah. And Lucy Dacus is, is a tall woman. So yeah, that was really, really exciting. It was cool to see that kind of the excitement for that getting really drummed up. Plus we got three new songs. Three singles. Three singles, each led by a different member of Boy Genius. Um, Two of them are kind of more or less just, so we had Emily I'm Sorry, which is more or less just a Phoebe Bridgers solo song. Uh, It would have fit right in on Punisher. And in fact, I think I read somewhere as soon as it came out that it was actually an outtake from Punisher that Phoebe basically was didn't really know what to do with and then brought to um julian and lucy and said hey we should do an album um so that was kind of the impetus which is really cool to see and um, we also had the song i think is it true blue the lucy day true song? blue yeah true, true blue, blue which yes. was you know very much in the vein of the sort of stuff lucy was writing on home video great song really loved it uh, but the most exciting one i think was 20 dollars, the first of the three songs because yes. it is a song that features all three of the the women the genius women, the genius, the boys, the boys in question are back in town and they're all on this song. And it was really exciting. And it was just this really maximalist uh, song that built to something really, really awesome. So I'm really excited to see how the album itself fleshes out as well. We're probably at some point in time before that, I think Jake at, at the very least wants to sort of reflect on the music of these three amazing artists. Maybe even talk about the boy genius EP. We might do something in the lead up to it. We'll see what go- happens. It's just the kind of thing that we're made to talk about. And, and if you've been a fan of the Jamsd podcast for any amount of time, you probably understand why that is. Uh, we also, in terms of pod core uh, album announcements as well, we got an album announcement from the one, the only Mr. Rustin Kelly this week Woo! announced his new record. Is the album also called The Weakness or was that just the single yeah. name? Okay, so it is the the album's called The Weakness. I'm pretty sure that's another April release, I want to say. Mm-hmm. And uh, the lead single, The Weakness, dropped as well, which is some, you know, it's kind of fun, funny how it's 
it's kind of closer to a national or a boy genius song than a rusted kelly song i mean is, it, it, he heard make an emo album when we talked about his last record and said bet yeah it's very straightforward very dour very moody and very beautiful and i have listened to it an awful lot as i know have also morgan and jake great song he responded to me on twitter put that up right now yeah yeah i'm gonna put you a show oh, yeah if you're watching the video i'll put a screenshot right in front of our heads right now of the awesome interaction that morgan had with rustin kelly this week also another announcement we finally got officially in fact this only happened uh well i guess it was a few days ago by the time you're seeing this but as we record this this album announcement was only made official today uh we ha- are getting a new album from paranormal uh, as we expected, I wasn't expecting it to come so soon though. It's out the end of this month. Um, and so we'll be talking about it probably in a couple of weeks from now. It's called after the magic and it's very, I'm look, we're all very excited. I can't believe it. It's like, it's just, it's just going to happen. It's just going to be here all mm. of a sudden. There's no like, yeah, I, what's really cool about it as well. I think paranormal is still like on Longinus, but the record itself, the physical copies of the record are being sort of distributed by top shelf records, which is, you know, a, mm-hmm. obviously a bigger label than Longinus. So it seems like this album will actually get a little bit more of a wider release and maybe a little bit more of a kind of um, label backing pull behind it as well, which might be really, really awesome for that artist. Uh, and if it's anywhere near as good as the single, then we're going to be in for something special. Uh, we also got an announcement this week, you know, somewhat less podcore, uh, that there will be a new album from Fallout Boy this year. I, uh, uh, I, yeah. I know that uh, none of us are exactly fans of, of Mr. Boy, but hey, it felt like the kind of thing I had to mention here. It's a new Fallout Boy album. Coming that's, out this the, year. that's the YouTuber, right? Who gives away all the money. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, that's him. Mr. Yeah. Boy. I, Mr. Boy. Yeah. I, I'm, Mr. I'm gonna be real Boy. Cool. I, I have to be hest of the fact that uh, my girlfriend is a at least a former Fallout Boy fan, hey, and look. her siblings are as well. I I listened to that new single, and I can at least say this much: it doesn't sound like Mania, so it's an improvement, and that's all I'll say about that. Who cares? Aren't we all, to some degree, former Fallout Boy fans, even if we don't want to admit it? No, not even in like two thousand and five. No. Uh, Okay, fair enough. You know, I was five. Yeah, I was and, and, more and you were like the five toddler. year old with the best taste who immediately knew that these Fallout Boy jokers were trash. You just you're on the playground being like, "Hey, y'all, listen to John Prime." Okay, yes. If I was listening to music <laughs> when I was five, it was John Prime and of his ilk. <laughs> oh well, uh, big big. Everything about Morgan makes so much more sense now. Well, you look, you know, we all, sorry, we all weren't listening to fucking Bob Dylan when we were seven months old or whatever. <laughs> yeah, we weren't also all listening to Autecker when we were three years old. So yeah, I was, about, I was about, about to say, it was like, <laughs> Mr. I listened to Orbital when my dad showed it to me when I was a fetus. Hey, look, I liked plenty of shit. <laughs> back then all right like plenty of real trash hey look i liked things but the things you liked they were stupid my things were cool though (laughs) anyway the new fallout boy album is called so much parentheses for stardust it's out on 24th of march (laughs) gotta have a parenthetical in there it has a cover that is like has already been remarked upon many times its similarity to the cover of Fiona Apple's Fetch the Bolt Cutters. Uh, but I, for one, oh, am a yeah. fan of, of, of the random ass photo of a dog. Dog. Uh, just it's just random, a dog. Random dog album cover genre. So, is, yeah, is we'll this supposed to goes. communicate that, like, oh, we're, we're going back to our roots? Here's a dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, is it. Um, Oh no, it's a fucking, I think it's a sheep on the Infinity on High cover. I thought it might be a dog. Never mind. I don't know what they're trying to channel with this. There's like a some furries on the Foley Ado album cover. Maybe that's what they're referencing. From furry to real dog. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Um, but yeah, look, we'll see what we'll see what we'll see how it turns out, you know? Okay, so uh new singles that were that dropped this week as well from albums that we are anticipating or just singles in general um first i want to shout out i think it is i think this artist does have an album coming up but i haven't 
I don't know if it's confirmed or anything like that, but I want to shout it out because I checked out the song on a whim and I quite enjoyed it. Uh, ASAP Rocky dropped a new song called Same Problems. I think a reference to his song Fucking Problems, which I think is 10 years old this year. Uh, it's a very moody song. It has Thundercat on bass and it's just got this real Ooh. sort of sumptuous vibe to it. Uh, I I really enjoyed it, so I wanted to shout it out as well. It's kind of flown under the radar a little bit because it's not like particularly bombastic or whatever, but I, I liked it. I thought it was a really good song. Uh, there was a new single this week from the great Americana band Wednesday, who I am slowly getting very into as a result of my enjoyment of the MJ Linderman album, which we talked about last week. Wednesday do have a new album coming out called Rat Saw God on the 7th of April. Look, they've had two singles so far. The The first one is this incredible sort of eight-minute Americana fucking country opus called Bull Believer that I really love. And the new song, Chosen to Deserve, is much more straightforward sort of Americana, alt country, but really great riff, really great guitar playing from MJ as well. And also I'm kind of slowly falling a little bit in love with Carly Hartsman, front woman of this band as well. She's just, her energy is just, I don't know, it's the kind of thing that, is just really, really fun. That's not the right word at all, but we'll go with that. Uh, this is really fun. She's a cool, really fun. you know, it's like, it's that kind of slacker. Easy, neat. <laughs> it's that oh same God. kind of slacker indie vibe. It's kind of like <laughs> Phoebe Bridgers, yes, except so like stick. distinctly with her distinctly more Southern drawl. Um, so yeah, she's great. I'm very much getting into this band and I'm excited for the new album. And we also had a new single this week from Metallica, Screaming Suicide. Mm. August, you made me aware of this, so I'll throw over to you on this one. Uh, yes, yeah, so Screaming Suicide, new one from Metallica. I would not call this a particularly exciting song. I think the riff here is quite predictable and bland, especially by Metallica's standards at this point. Uh, I think the cries of Screaming Suicide on this song are great. Uh, it's, it's a really, you know funny, exciting Metallica song that I think points towards all the directions that we are specifically looking for out of this album. It, it, it's silly to us because Metallica are just silly. You know, it's just inarguably silly when James Hetfield makes those tortured faces. It's a very serious song. Like it's a song about, you know, how you're confronting the, you know, the masculine norm of, you know, repressing suicidal thoughts and not opening up and all that sort of thing. It's a song with a very powerful message, a really important message, especially for what I imagine to be a lot of Metallica fans, young and old, who might need to hear it. So I think it's a really admirable song. And I don't say that with condescension either, as though, oh, this is what's good about it, even if the song itself is crap. I think the song's pretty good, to be honest. Uh, it's about as good as Lux Eternal was in that sense that it's like, you know, we're in solid six out of 10 Metallica territory. It's... It sounds good. It's well produced. I like the riff. It's got a nice little Kurt solo in the middle of it. And mm. I enjoy the whole atmosphere and the visuals and the vibe. And I think the again, the lyrical message is a one that's nice to hear coming from Metallica, even if it's not necessarily a new one. And I think it's executed without sort of veering into cringe all that much. So yeah, but you know, it is, you know, it is still yet again, especially if you watch the music video, it's a lot of James Hetfield making tortured faces and you know, that is funny. So yeah, mm, good Metallica indeed. song, another uh, solid single, really looking forward to the new album, um, hoping to see maybe a little bit more depth in the analysis of some of these darker themes, but you know, can't hope for too much from James Hetfield, who's not exactly a Pulitzer Prize winner, but still, I think it delivers basically all the all the basics, you know, the, the meat and potatoes stuff that you would want from a Metallica song, and I don't say that as a way of tossing it off. It's good. It's solid. I look forward to the next one. So uh, in music news this week, we had this. Um, okay. So we didn't really discuss this, but I did notice it on um, stereo gum. And I want to just talk about it. One, because the artist in question is one that is very relevant to most of us. And we're very interested in, but also just because this particular announcement or whatever you want to call it, is just kind of like hilariously pretentiously communicated but anyway so frank ocean is in his words uh once again interested in more durational bodies of work 
that's the that's the the crux of his latest cryptic instagram post you fucking loser like where he goes just on, drop the music where so what's me. funny is like um i don't know if it was from frank directly or it was just from frank's team or whatever but it was phrased as this kind of like third person story of the recording artist who rallies against the album distribution model because he believes that, that the singles distribution model of just dropping songs is the way of the future but now that after years of doing that the recording artist has come to realize has come to become more interested in the durational model it's just this hilariously pretentious um bullshit post that ultimately ends up as frank ocean might make an album this year but <laughs> i just found that whole incredibly roundabout way of saying nothing at all to be kind of funny um but maybe what this is communicating maybe we're getting a frank ocean album this year maybe maybe it is already done i mean he is still headlining coachella from what we know which yeah. i mean is a pretty telltale sign but so again with that frank... alone that alone suggests to me this might be worth reporting on because there may be very well, you know, a real chance that he actually is dropping an album this year. And it'll be, you know, and it, it's fine, especially because he's been spending most of his time in the last few years doing things like, you know, the luxury cock rings for $25,000 that he was dropping. Was that last year? That was fucking random. Uh, either last year or the year before, something like that. Yeah. It, it, what? It, it, regardless him dropping will be the event of the year yeah if it does happen yeah and i just want to say like in sort of looking through this story and kind of clicking back through a bunch of different things i've seen all these photos of him he's a fashion icon i guess i'm not really all into that world but to me every photo <laughs> that, I've, that says a lot really. every, every photo i've seen of him i'm like he looks like a, he he looks like he's been dressed by a fucking like he, he's just dressed himself on shuffle you know what i mean like i don't get any yes of it. it makes no Look, sense to me it, when but, it comes to the fa the the fashion iconography of the odd future crew nobody's going to be beating tyler the creator's fits uh, and frank should stop trying yeah whatever anyway p potentially new frank ocean music this year who fucking knows uh, one thing that I found really interesting, and now I didn't know anything about this, this is music news, but it also dovetails into the world of TV and film as well, is that uh, Nathan Fielder and Benny Safdie are working on a new TV show together called The Curse, uh, with uh, which Nathan Fielder is starring in with Emma Stone. And this collaboration alone, Fielder and Benny Safdie, really intrigued me. But we also found out this week that uh, One Tricks Point Never is scoring it. So there's these complete okay. confluence of really, really awesome artists. So I'm really looking forward to the show. I think it might be, I don't know if it's an HBO show. Oh, it's a Showtime show called The Curse, uh, which is, uh, if it's going to be anything like the show that Fielder, I guess, dominated 2022 with, the rehearsal, then it's going to be completely fucking insane. So I'm really, really looking forward to that. And I'm looking forward to seeing what Benny Safety brings to it because he's both uh, co-creating it and also co-starring in it. And, also looking to see what One Entrix Point Never brings to it as well. That's going to be really, really interesting, I think. Also in the news as well, we had new inductions, new annual inductions into the Songwriters Hall of Fame, which is slightly less, gets slightly less pressed than the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but is slightly more interesting, I think. And the new... I should think so, given the fact that I've never heard of it before. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the I bring this up only because the new nominees are an eclectic bunch and feature people that we love. Sade Adu is getting nominated into the Ooh. songwriters hall of fame this year as well Good as pick. is uh jeff lynn of elo which is great to see and my favorite of yes. the three of them well there were more than three but i picked three and my favorite of them purely because i just love the idea of this person getting nominated into the songwriters hall of fame is snoop dogg so congratulations to sade <laughs> jeff lynn and snoop dogg truly like an odd thruple if there ever were one <sighs> So unfortunately, we get to this segment now where we talk about the artists who have passed away in the world of music this week. A really devastating week as well. Um, I want to start with one that has kind of, I think, gotten lost in the shuffle a little bit. A really particularly sad one for me, given that this is a 
this person was a core component of one of my favorite grunge bands. That is, of course, the Screaming Trees bassist Van Connor uh, passed away at the age of 55 this week. Just gutting news, to be honest, especially what feels like so Way soon too young. after Mark Lanigan as well. Um, and yeah, and just far too young as well. We, of course, if you didn't know, we talked about the Screaming Trees seminal 1992 record suite Oblivion just a couple of months ago. That's a great record club. If you want to join us in, mm -hmm. you know, celebrating the music that they made together, then go and check that out. But yeah, really tragic loss this week. Uh, we also had... Uh, to say goodbye to Yukihiro Takahashi of uh, Yellow Magic Orchestra as well. Um, you know, it's crazy that all three members of Yellow, Yellow Magic Orchestra were essentially in either late 70s or 80s this week, and we still had all of them. It was kind of wild, but unfortunately we had to say goodbye to one of them. I know, August, you and I both spent some time mm -hmm. this week revisiting the music of Yellow Magic Orchestra as well. Just one of the most seminal acts in the history of the development and progression of electronic music and electronic instruments into the world of pop music as well. Anything you want to say about Takashi? Yeah, and I've I've also been listening to some uh, Yellow Magic Orchestra this week, although for me it was a bit more of a discovery because I was only familiar with uh, uh, Ryuichi Sakamoto's solo material from this time. But I think I think what we get here is a very uh, interesting and exciting combination of uh, music that would go on to inspire so many of the scores for classic video games, while also drawing on the conventions of very cheesy uh lounge jazz uh overall it just made for uh the first two yellow magic orchestra albums the self-titled and solid state survivor made for a very interesting pairing of uh classic nostalgic feeling uh electronic records that obviously had a very huge impact on the future and uh electronic and just video games in general films even uh there's a lot to be uh drawn from here there's a lot to appreciate i think it's definitely worth your time mm. yeah agree and like you know, listening to them this week, I listen, also listened to their self-titled record and Solid State Survivor. You know, they get compared or talked about in conversations with Kraftwerk a lot. And I understand why, because they are both sort of artists who represent not just that primitive era of electronic music and electronic textures, but how that was applied to pop music frameworks in the 70s. But one key distinction, I think, is that Kraftwerk were purely kind of just diving solely into the world of these synthesized tones and this electronic technology. Whereas, as you mentioned, Yellow Magic Orchestra integrated these primitive technologies with conventional rock and pop instrumentation as well and made music that, I don't say this to say that it's superior in any way because I definitely have a bit more of a connection and preference to Kraftwerk because of how much their music means to me. But Yellow Magic Orchestra's music did have this, for lack of a, bit, of a better word, human touch, where you had this added complexity of these very synthesized melodies and cores of these songs that were situated within this sort of rock band context, almost, or a funk band, or even ska band, or however you want to kind of characterize what was happening there. Um, I mean, that was that particular era as well was a big time for like city pop and the, you know, the integration of things like ska into pop music in Japan specifically. So Yellow Magic Orchestra fit in their own way into that mold too. And so, yeah. Uh, Takahashi, of course, as the drummer for that band, was such a key part of the pulse and the the vibrancy of that music as well. So, yeah, it's a it's a it's a tough loss to be honest. It's it's a rough loss, and um, you know, I feel like it hit especially hard this week as well because, as we'll talk about shortly, um, you know, we're also listening to Ryuichi Sakamoto this week, uh, multiple of us because he put out a new record as well, and that listening experience. I won't get into it now because we'll have a wee segment on it, but that listening experience was particularly somber. Um, and, you know, it's a time where you're already thinking about death and you're already sort of preparing yourself for the loss of this amazing figure. And then to kind of be blindsided by the loss of someone who worked so closely with them and with whom 
they Sakamoto, you know, kind of began their career essentially. I mean, he'd already had solo work thousand knives. I think already he'd already recorded that before he even joined the yellow magic orchestra, but still, you know, that that was such a, you know, those were the salad days and they came up together and, you know, Ryuichi, I imagine already being in a place where he is, you know, where his death, his impending death because he does have stage four cancer is sort of consuming him and is definitely a huge part of his artistic focus. It's hard to imagine how he must feel losing a friend in amongst all of that. All this is to say tremendous loss. If you haven't listened to any of the music of Yellow Magic Orchestra, use this as an excuse to to dive into it as well. Jake, I know you, you enjoy their music as well. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Tremendous, tremendous loss. And not even the most high, pri- high profile loss of this week as well because just the day before we record this um we lost david crosby um the first of crosby stills nash and young to go and yeah we've already lost some seminal rock figures this year some seminal his you know figures in the history of classic rock i mean fucking jeff beck was just a week ago but something in particular stings about crosby I mean, I guess it's bound to because he's such a huge and well-known figure in, in rock history. Crosby famously was someone who lived his life in a very devil may care way for a long time. Like he was just, you know, through this through the 70s and 80s, so much of the stories surrounding, you know, the music that he made, both on his own and with Stills and Nash and with Stills and Nash and Young and with Nash and with whatever configuration of those four men. And, and of course, going all the way back to the birds as well which is where Crosby began, you know, so much of his story was consumed by his, you know, uh, rampant battle with drug addiction and just this lifestyle that he had that felt like there was no way he was going to make it out of that. And he did. And he came out stronger and actually ended up, you know, in this last decade of his life, you know, not only re-entering the public eye as this kind of figure who is this kind of lovable curmudgeon online, not to mention one of our greatest posters ever from that era, just someone who completely gave no fucks at all about what anyone thought of him, but also had a bit of a musical renaissance as well with his last couple of records that he put out, particularly, I think, 2014's Cross was a really well-received album. So, you know, the story of Crosby is one that is, you know, it's filled with tragedy but it's also kind of inspirational as well. You know, it reminds me a little bit of Warren Zavon, who also lived really, really hard and ended up sort of after being forgotten about for the longest time because of his behavior and the way that he alienated so many people, ended up having a resurgence of some of his most powerful material in the waning years of his life. But the fact that Cross made it to 80 is insane. Um, It doesn't diminish his loss at all. It still feels you know, it's really shit, to be honest. But again, it gives us an excuse to remember him. It gives us an excuse to start. It gives us an excuse to revisit his music as well. I've been a huge fan of the birds ever since I was a kid because my dad loves the birds. One of the few kind of massive rock and roll staples, I think, that he is actually into. So yeah, now that we've kind of covered the bases of the biggest music news of the week, let's take a little time now to talk about what we've been listening to. Jake, what have you been listening to? Well, I think the biggest undertaking I've had in the past week or so is I'm really setting myself up for future failure here because the fact that I'm getting so deeply into this discography is uh, I have no excuse to not listen to other albums and other bands, no matter how long their records are anymore. Uh, I I think that uh, once I complete this particular discography, Riley's probably going to be like, when are you going to when are you going to listen to NTS? Jake, when are you gonna when are you gonna do it? Because I've been listening to the discography of the band Natural Snow Buildings, and uh, the reason that I say all of that is because Natural Snow Buildings have like fourteen or so albums. Uh, they've been active since like right at the turn of the century uh, in like 2000, 2001 ish. Actually, no, they have more than that. They have twenty six studio releases, um, and. This is a strange ass band and every single one of their albums is long as 
fuck. Like the the more digestible releases this band have made are 60 minutes. Like that's the shortest that they bottom out at. Like all of their really revered stuff is at minimum like at least two and a half hours long. And when you I mean, also get a life. I mean, like, sincerely, they released, not to mention, they have, like, so many releases that are so close to each other that they've made multiple two-and-a-half-hour-long albums within the span of, like, one year. It's kind of nuts. But the thing is, is that they're also, they're an ambient, drone, psychedelic folk, post-rock band, and you combine all these things together with, like, long ass albums fucking genre tags that are super unfriendly and tend to be on the more patience trying end of things it's not an easy band to recommend to people and it's also not an easy band to get into because i've had a lot of these on my radar for a while now just because a lot of them are particularly beloved projects on websites like rate your music and i kind of broke through the mold with listening to their album the dance of the moon and the sun from 2006 and this is the reason i have been listening to this band so feverishly and been so enthusiastic about consuming their catalog because the dance of the moon and the sun is a goddamned masterpiece again it is a 157 minute long album yes but i've also listened to it all the way through like five times now because this is just amazing listening to this is a truly very arresting spellbinding experience where it kind of has a structure similar to uh boards of canada's geogaddy where it'll have a shorter more kind of digestible track that kind of feeds into a much bigger larger one and they kind of don't have all that much in common like sonically it's really more of a thematic transition and it does that with its more free folk elements and it'll have these like minute long two minute long three minute long more traditional kind of lo-fi folk songs and then they'll transition into the bigger larger wider post-rock ambient and drone pieces and what makes this band really unique specifically within the realm of this kind of music is that all of their instrumentation like it's not like very little of it is electronic like all of it's with like actual instruments and you know that's not a diss on electronic music or ambient music because most of the ambient music that i love is wholly electronic but it lends a certain clarity to their sound a certain tangible tangibility to it that makes it feel a little bit more I don't know grounded than a lot of music like this does and it lends a very unique specific texture to these sounds that feel more inviting and sort of all-encompassing there's so many amazing songs on here the piece of music that I'm the most enamored with so far is uh on the the first half uh that being the 12 minute long Wisconsin mm. which is basically just like this looping guitar melody and it's just fucking beautiful I'd listen to this if it was 30 minutes long and trust me when I say natural snow buildings has songs that are 30 minutes long so I really wouldn't uh put it past uh, me to enjoy more extended versions of these and I find myself finding this album in particular easier and easier to come back to this is a genuinely one of my favorite albums at this point now and I love the way that it climaxes with stuff like tunneling into the structure until it falls mm. and remains in the ditch of the dead mm. just every single piece on here is so dynamic so textured so cool I can't get enough of it so I've been listening to not only the dance of the moon and the sun but gradually making my way through uh their catalog uh, as the week has progressed, I've listened mm. to things like their other highly acclaimed album, Shadow Kingdom, from 2009, which is even longer. Uh, and it's also just, it's a bigger album. I would say that Dance of the Moon and the Sun is a very intimate album. That's an album that makes me feel like, it, it makes me have like a nostalgic reminiscence of like parts of my childhood. It, it's something that just kind of 
saps the world away and makes you feel like you're the only person in existence. And it's very lonely, but very comforting. There's lots of different tones that are explored within it. Whereas Shadow Kingdom legitimately feels like you're listening to a story happen with this kind of music. It feels like you're listening to like this medieval, like fantastical world being destroyed and then recreated throughout the process of the track list. And it's a really engaging listen. I, I think that this too is honestly, like it's a really diverse set of songs and they're for the most part, just as strong as the material that I've seen on Dancing the Moon and the Sun or just mm -hmm. this band at their best. Uh, the, I've listened to some of their later stuff that doesn't get quite as much attention, like uh, The Night Country, which is like a kind of a gothic folk album. There's a little bit more going on here. It's the, the atmosphere is very much horror movie-esque uh, and it's a little bit shorter of a record. It's like only an hour long. So that might be something that might, if you're, you know, intimidated by this band pretty significantly. And I've also listened to 2010's The Centauri Agent, which is basically their space ambient album, which I mean, it's their take on space ambience, and that's a particular subgenre of ambient music that I love a lot. And this band using their kind of instrumental palette to conjure that is just as good as that sounds. It's also like I think that's more close to like a hundred minutes. Fucking uh, forty minute opener. What is this? A fucking Richard Dawson album? I mean, <laughs> well. Uh, it's honestly, that's a fucking, that's a fucking amazing piece. I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend Centauri Agent to people who like are trying to get into the band, even though it is kind of an accessible release because it is one of the like most stagnant, like least filled with momentum. It's just like, it's very sedentary. There's a lot of stasis in these compositions, but I tend to enjoy that part of it. And it's just kind of interesting getting to see them explore this because genuinely what makes these albums such compelling listens is their dynamism is that there is so much going on sound wise in all of these i know that people when they imagine drone music they tend to think of something that's a little bit more monotonous but honestly nothing could be further from the truth so like i'll back you up jake i listened to dance of the moon and sun this week as well and i found it to be an exceptional record I, I particularly love like because one of the things that does I think make these records somewhat more approachable is that they are often sort of divided into subsections of of music oh, yeah. within them. So, um, Dance of Moon and Sun has sort of two discs or two sides, I suppose you could say, the Moon and the Sun side, and particularly the Moon side, the first side of this, I I found particularly mm -hmm. sort of arresting. It's the side that has the longest songs on it, uh, tracks like Wisconsin, tracks like um, Divided Reincarnation, tracks like uh, Ghostly Humming. Uh, amazing pieces oh, of drone ambient point. music and the real selling point i think is that these pieces are they're hypnotic they capture you in this sort of trance like state and they're beautiful and the melodies are gorgeous but they're actually not static all that often like they actually no. have a lot of progression and movement within them so they never feel as though they are iterating on an idea for too long or kind of long for the sake of it i suppose and no. Um, for the most part throughout the record, they do a really great job of using these pieces and holding them up alongside these shorter uh, folk pieces in between them. And those folk pieces don't always land for me, but the majority of the time I do. And I think particularly when they are there to give you a bit of a buffer between these longer pieces, they work really, really well. I could definitely do without the the track on the second disc that has the spoken word with that woman talking about like ripping off genital skin and shit <laughs> I, I could do without that was very not good um but you know it's 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 a it's a thing they did uh but there's plenty to love on here i also appreciate the the, the shout outs to uh f figures such as the famous journalist gary webb and the filmmaker john carpenter as well and titles mm -hmm. of these pieces that uh i feel like give the the pieces themselves a little bit extra, more character and color um that's a really great thing as well and they just they're gorgeous sounds i think i agree that the record finishes marvelously with those last few tracks in particular so yeah it, it's a it's a lengthy excursion but it is worth it and i think that i was impressed with how dynamic it was and with how actually sophisticated and satisfying the progressions of these drone pieces were um it's very easy mm -hmm. to just find a nice hypnotic sound and just hang on it for a really long time 
Um, but the more drone music I listen to, the less interesting that is. And the more interested I am in finding yeah. people who can do things that are more unconventional with that structure and with that format. And natural snow buildings definitely do that. The other thing I will shout out that I listened to uh, for the first time this week is something curious. I don't even really remember how I actually like came across this in particular, but it became on my radar when I just heard that it was a cool jazz fusion album. Um, but this is a Japanese big band experimental jazz fusion album uh, entitled uh, Shibuboshi. Uh, and the artist behind it is Shibusashi Z Shibu Sashi Rizaru. And this is like by far their most popular release, uh, even though I still think that this is sort of a something that's due for like a, a rediscovery online. And this is sort of like leading the charge with this particular discography. And this is nuts. I, I don't know what I was expecting. Like I see, you know, big band jazz fusion. I expect something to be pretty lively. This is like the largest sounding jazz album I've ever heard in my life. There is so much actual bombast and so much like, whoa, holy shit, that it, it it's really like takes you off your guard when you first listen to it uh, in a way that I haven't been since I first heard like Mahavishnu Orchestra, which I think is probably the closest thing to this. But even then, that's more like guitar driven fusion. This is honestly, it's still more like horn driven properly. There's even a cover of the Sun Ra piece Spaces the Place on here, which I'm going to be honest with you. I think they do better than the original version. It's so fucking awesome this is just an album that is a load of fun it's an hour long which certainly does run kind of high for some jazz albums um but honestly it goes by so fucking quickly these like proper pieces on here are just fucking unmatched uh i think the first two pieces uh images and the dom are genuinely two of the best pieces of jazz i've ever heard in my life uh th this is just so much fun it has this cover that's just full of like color and just like all of these colliding like textures and backgrounds and stuff and that's exactly what listening to this album is like and I highly recommend it if you even if like you aren't super into jazz fusion I feel like this takes from so many different areas of jazz that it's just incredibly easy to enjoy even if you don't enjoy like late era Miles Davis if you enjoy like John Coltrane's earlier stuff you're still gonna find yourself like perfectly at home here so a huge underrated jazz record to shout out there I, I i just thought that was absolutely spectacular and to cap things off the new release of the week that i'll talk about is uh an album from a doom metal band uh that being ahab and last year i actually listened to their debut album 2006's the call of the wretched sea uh, that's honestly one of the best albums I listened to last year. That is maybe the single heaviest metal album I've heard, period. Um, and not even in the sense that it like, you know, like it's it, it goes the hardest or whatever. That still probably goes to something like a Serpent Column or Dillinger Escape Plan. But when I say that this is the metal album that harnesses the most weight, the most gravity, the one that makes you feel like the actual ocean is on top of you with its riffs, this takes the cake. Uh, it's a spectacular album, and I haven't listened to some of their other stuff, which is a shame because they're supposed to be good, a pretty consistent band that doesn't drop particularly regularly, but they released their first album in eight years since 2015's The Boats of the Glen Carrig uh, and their album The Coral Tombs. And so far, this is actually a release that's uh, caught on uh pretty well so far this year uh just because not a lot of bands have dropped uh and they generally have a pretty solid output and i was excited to get to it just because i was like oh i like this band i like one of their previous albums a hell of a lot uh so let's see what this is all about and this is a really solid effort so far this is uh you know i can't exactly say oh it's one of the best albums of 2022 just because you know i've heard like six albums this year and they've all been varying shades of good 2021 now 
But I can certainly say that this is still a very solid effort from the band. It does have kind of a narrative undergoing it. They really like to play around with like their first album is kind of a quasi adaptation of Moby Dick, which, you know, haha, a lot, a lot of metal bands and sludge metal bands really like to do that. Huh? But uh, they kind of have a story going on here that's like a sort of parallel to 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And with that, you get a vocal presence on this album that they haven't really used before. The clean vocals on here are super operatic. They're very, like, big, very, like, campy, I would describe them as being. Uh, that's probably an element, certainly not for everyone. It took me a bit getting used to, but the performances themselves are awfully powerful. They're very strong. And the traditional Death Doom vocals that this band are known for are also on here just as much, if not more. So there's a bit of a dynamism in their sound that quite hasn't been there before. And I would be lying if I said I didn't think that dynamism comes at a bit of a sacrifice sacrifice just because the heaviness on this album is far less pronounced than it is on Call of the Wretched Sea. I think the first two tracks are good at displaying that dynamism, but they are this band on not necessarily autopilot, but just doing what they've done about as well as they've done it. Uh, for example, the second track on here, Colossus of the Liquid Graves, I think is a solid song, but probably my least favorite thing here. But then when the third track, uh, Mobilis and Mobili comes in, and that's when shit gets hard as fuck. These riffs are fucking titanic. They're enormous. This is when the album really kicks into gear for me and doesn't really let go until the end. I think songs like The Sea as the Desert are fantastic. A Coral Tomb, the title track, is really great. And we also have some interesting features on here. The final song on here, The Maelstrom, which I think is pretty Confidently, my favorite thing on here features legendary uh, doom metal band, funeral doom metal band, uh, Esoteric. And they contribute to this fantastically. Again, the riffs on here are fucking sumptuous. Um, that said, I do think that the album kind of, you know, at 66 minutes, it's just an album that, while not necessarily leaving any, like, slack in its track list, I would say, and is never anything short of a great doom metal band being a great doom metal band, I don't necessarily think it needed to be that long. I feel like if you cut maybe one of the more non-essential tracks here, again, like Colossus of the Liquid Graves, it would just be a tighter album, undoubtedly, and you do have a bit of a narrative sacrifice, considering that each one of these is a a very definitive A to B little story, and that's cool, but I don't find it necessarily hugely compelling. I just kind of find it novel. So I, I definitely got a lot of enjoyment out of this. Uh, it's a very, very good metal album from a very, very good uh, band, but I would say that it just does not live up to maybe the uh, reputation and legacy that this band has beforehand. It's an enjoyable time. Uh, if you like Doom and Funeral Doom Metal, absolutely check this out. If you are more on the fence or aren't really into this, this will not change your mind, and I would go many, many other records that are a little bit more accessible sound-wise to get into something like this. So, it's a good release, a solid release to kick off the year, but I would be lying if I said I didn't maybe hope for something a little bit more substantial, even though, again, this is obviously not a scant release. This has a lot of thought, a lot of love put into it, can certainly see why a lot of people like it a lot. Anyways, what I've been listening to this week, well, one thing I thought was uh, worth shouting out was the record For My Angel. This is a kind of jazz record from Korean saxophonist Kim Oki. This came out in 2020, very early 2020 in January, so it's no surprise we were not aware of it, and also it's no surprise because it's a rather obscure record. Either way, uh, what Mr. Kim Oki has for us on this project is a very interesting blend of not only like spiritual uh, kind of Coltrane kind of jazz stuff, but also he mixes in a really healthy amount of R&B influences into this. Like it's very p prominent. There's even some tracks that feature some nice uh, sultry vocals on here. A, a real interesting note about this album is the very distinct personality of Kim Oki as 
a saxophonist because I think there is something on here that like even having only heard this one album, I bet you I could pick him out in a lineup of saxophone players because the way he mics his saxophone is very peculiar because you can kind of hear the bubbles of spittle inside of the saxophone reed in the recording. It's a very strange stylistic choice that I think will definitely hold some people back from fully enjoying this when ever so occasionally in that in the mix you can hear this weird kind of wet bubbly noise which is not terribly pleasant but that aside the rest of the record has some really uh just satisfying chugging fusion grooves that can go from this gentle autumn breeze sound to this harsh uh searing like hot desert summer sound it's a very dynamic sounding album that goes through a lot of changes up uh within the songs themselves but also the songs themselves are not structurally unified there's some interesting ideas some that pass you by a little too quickly some that go on for just long enough either way i really recommend checking out at least something from kim oki he has a very large discography of 17 albums released since 2013 at the earliest it appears but yeah this is good uh the other thing i'll talk about today is something that's just classic that I, I really enjoyed uh, from someone I've been meaning to properly delve into for a while now. I'm, of course, talking about one Mr. Danny Elfman and his musical project Oingo Boingo, uh, particularly their 1981 debut record. Only a lad. He's only a lad. I think this record, more so than Big Mess, which we reviewed for this show back in 2021, I think was when it came mm-hmm. out. This project, I think, feels is, well, a lot more succinct, hence not being called Big Mess, and a lot more uh, sorted and organized. I think there's some really uh, sharp uh, satirical political material on here from Elfman, along with Damn, just some really bright and uh, idiosyncratic new wave grooves, but also some that dip into some really uh, dark, kind of almost progressive territory that reminds me of of something that a, a Frank Zappa would conjure up on a record of his. And, and some of that is that very uh, harmonious, synchronized style of playing, which you can hear all over this record. And like the songs here... I think the the messages and points get across quickly. You've, of course, got uh, classics like Little Girls, one of uh, the enduring hits of this band. Absolute banger. Absolute banger. Let those out, 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 let those out. Do you, do you want that on the internet? Because that's there now. Yeah, it's a... Look, I have loved The liberals this song. don't want you to know that Oingo Boingo's Little Girls is a fucking banger. They also don't want to let you know that capitalism is a fucking banger. Capitalism, <laughs> the song on this album, of yeah. course. Yeah, Killer uh, No, that's a podcast it. sponsored by the Daily Wire. Uh, no, I, yeah, I love capitalism. Uh, that's a very funny song. I, I really enjoy how it's, it's being sung. Like, you can interpret so much not only about the person being sung about, but also the person singing the song from mm. the lyrics. It's a really cute, cheeky, uh, cheeky moment. I've I've really loved uh, the singles that I've heard from this band, so I'm excited to delve further into their luxurious and acclaimed catalog. This is a dub. As far as I'm just going to put out here, this is a dub for me because I recommended this album specifically to august this week and so it was very vindicating Mm -hmm. that august was completely on board i it's just one of the funniest record that's actually a thing that i think is worth emphasizing this album is hilarious Mm -hmm. like the sense of humor on this the mischief um but also how well attuned all of that is to what the album's going for musically and how you know elfman's wit really accentuates and complements uh just these great post-punk grooves that the record just really fully leans into the songs are really lean as well the album really has no fat on it it's just a series of really funny songs each with its own distinct topic and subject matter often in the guise of a 
character study um, that ends up just being really, really funny and satisfying. All right. So <laughs> a couple of things I want to shout out. So my week has been more or less veering back and forth between two particular artists that I'm currently kind of fixated on. Um, and they're actually related in the sense that they actually work together quite a lot uh, in the early part of both of their solo careers, respectively. And so I want to start off by talking about an artist uh, who I've always heard really, really good things about, has always come really, really highly recommended, especially from a friend of the podcast, Spencer, who has this artist's most famous solo record on his 100 best albums of all time list, which I know has inspired a lot of listening of uh, Jake and myself recently. Um, so I wanted to get into this artist's solo career, and I started with this particular record, which is their third uh, solo album. Uh, the artist, of course, I'm talking about is David Sylvian, and the record in question is uh, 1987 Secrets of the Beehive, which is this absolutely gorgeous and beautifully composed uh, art pop record that flirts with uh, jazz pop, a little bit of fusion, a little bit of sophista pop in it as well. It's a kind of atmospheric album that is based so much around texture and feeling uh, and the way that particular performances of instrumentation, uh, positioning of instruments, and this real thought and consideration into the playing of each note really gives the whole thing the sense of beauty and enveloping uh, atmosphere that I absolutely love. In some of the poppier sort of moments, I was reminded a little bit of Kate Bush's early material. And then in some of the more ethereal moments, songs like the gorgeous uh, Let the Happiness In, for instance, or uh, Maria, uh, I was reminded of like latter era Talk Talk, like Spirit of Eden era Talk Talk. So it's kind of this like strange meeting point of Kate Bush and Talk Talk, if you can envision that. Um, but with David Sylvian's own distinct flavor, he's a very recognizable vocalist with this gorgeous sort of baritone voice that he uses to great effect. And the music's really tasteful, but also slightly unconventional as well. Some of the songs didn't quite land for me the first time I heard them but then coming back to the record I started to appreciate how unusual they were and how that was a real strength of them as well one other thing I checked out as well is that when I was you know doing my multiple listens to Secrets of the Beehive I was reading up about the creation of that record and Sylvian was never really all that happy with it because he was never able to complete it because there was the centerpiece song that he was working on for this album that he ran out of budget and couldn't actually make and had to release the album without it. And so he kind of doesn't like the album because it doesn't have that centerpiece song that he wanted to put on it. And that song is a song that he did eventually get to complete later on in his career. It's a song called Ride. And the only place you can hear it is on a compilation, a sort of greatest hits compilation called Everything and Nothing that he put out in the year 2000. And I just want to shout out this in particular because this song, I haven't heard any of the rest of the compilation because I want to listen to his albums first, but this song Ride is one of the greatest art rock, art pop, whatever, sophisticated pop songs I have ever heard in my life. It is, it's gorgeous. The... The chord progression, but particularly the key progression as well, because the song cycles through this um, very formulaic verse and chorus structure, but each time the chorus comes around, he changes the key. So it feels like the song is moving through these stages, even as it repeats its same core elements. But, you know, musical construction aside, this song is breathtaking. I It's eight minutes long, and it just completely flies by. It is one of the most stunning pieces of music I have heard discovered for the first time in a long time. So if you're interested in Sylvian's career, uh, take the time out to go and check out this song in particular, because I think it is an, a, a very impressive achievement. Um, so yeah, really into Sylvian this week. Going to keep highly, highly recommend his album gone to earth. Richard Barbieri is on that one as well, as well as King Crimson's Robert Fripp. Uh, and that also has the David Bowie low and hero oh, structure oh. of the first the first half is uh, just proper ambient pop songs, and then the second half is ambient, uh, and it's great. I listened to that this week when you were talking about Sylvian, and it was like, God damn, yeah. this shit sounds so good. Yeah, that's his you know, um, second record. That one's right next on my list to listen to, so that I will get to that in the next couple of days. I'm really excited for it. Shout out to, uh, you know, 
th that name, uh, Syl Sylvian. I like it a lot. It's uh, fun to primarily, say. Primarily, yeah, no, and there's a great piece of graffiti kind of right by where I live, and it's been there for like a couple of years, but it says, I've seen uh, Sylvia's pussy, so now I need to go and add, tack on an N, so it's I've seen Sylvian's pussy. Sylvian, <laughs> get your hate out of the oven. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, Richard Barbieri, have you seen Sylvie? <laughs> have you seen <laughs> Sylvie and Pussy? <laughs> That's amazing. I'm glad that I could bring that uh, joy to your to your uh, life there. Uh, absolutely, just by saying the word Sylvie in a number of times. <laughs> yep, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, fantastic. Always so, appreciate. It. Um, but the, yeah, so the other fixture of my week aside from Sylvian was Sakamoto. And so the first thing I did was revisit my favorite um, record that Sakamoto has put out. Uh, not that I've heard a whole bunch of them, although I definitely have now, but still I think his best uh, work in the LP format and what I would recommend anyone who wants to hear his best music is 1996. Uh, great compilation. Morgan, I know you're a huge fan of that as well. I revisited that this week. Loved it even more. That is just front to back fantastic. So many of Sakamoto's most famous pieces are on there and they're all performed, um, re-performed, sort of rearranged um, by Sakamoto and performed by him for this uh, record that is basically this beautiful career summary that he did in the late 90s. So I highly recommend that. It's just gorgeous, heartbreaking, beautiful, so much amazing music on that disc. Um, so I listened to that. And I, of course, went back and listened to uh, Thousand Knives, his first solo album, which I know, August, you're also a huge fan of. That's such a yes. like a massively creative record that just does so many exciting things, almost on mm. a track-to-track -track basis. It does something Absolutely. exciting. Um, I, I mean, I, I just love how also unabashedly goofy parts of it are, unabashedly dated, but it all, it works. It just works. It's such a uh, kinetic and creative listen that e that and much like the yellow magic orchestra stuff we were talking about earlier much like that uh even despite some of that uh temporal kitsch it really overcomes that and and lands as a significant and exciting piece of electronic music even today mm -hmm. absolutely like especially the title track is just one of these one of the most oh, amazingly yes. exciting pieces of music that you could listen to uh it's just a complete confection of gorgeous sounds topped off by a fantastically awesome guitar solo as well and that's just the beginning of the record like you go through these massively enveloping soundscapes as the album goes on but sakamoto never loses you because there's just so much there to get completely captured by and so yeah that's an amazing one of the great debut records for sure especially because it is you know when you if you listen to this in 1996 back to back you'd have no way of knowing that this is this they're the same people like they're just completely different in approach to composition and in the sound themselves um yet they are both Sakamoto through and through. And one of the things that you observe by, I think, taking a sample of the music that he's made throughout his very long, you know, 50 year career is just how versatile he is. You can think of Sakamoto, if you ask anyone who knows the name Ryuichi Sakamoto, what they associate him with, you know, some people will associate him with that kitschy pop and video game music of yellow magic orchestra some people will associate him purely with his soundtrack work on movies like merry christmas mr lawrence or more recently the revenant for instance or the last emperor and some people will associate him with specific pieces of music that they love that you know might have nothing to do with either of those things and that is just one of the great things you know, especially in his later career as well. And this is something that I got into this week when I listened to his 2017 album, Async, which is his last studio record before the one that he released this week, which is a fascinating record because, you know, here he's moved far away from the more dynamic compositions of his earlier days and is in this incredibly minimalist space. But it's not just minimalist piano compositions, which is what you might think of him for if you know uh, 1996. Um, but it's like these minimalist compositions that play around with dissonance and discomfort a lot. 
And I was really taken with this album because it's a record that it's the first thing that Sakamoto recorded after getting diagnosed with cancer in 2015. He spent a long time piecing this together. And for him, Async was a record about essentially trying to communicate what it feels like to suddenly be confronted with the knowledge that your life you know, is may, may well be heading towards its end and that you are now newly fighting something that you have no idea how to fight consciously that was a part of you before you knew it was. And basically all of these feelings that are going through him as he's trying to process this cancer diagnosis. And the whole concept of the record is compositions that it feel musical and feel musically satisfying, but where nothing really lines up where there's a kind of disarray about trying to, trying to evoke nature, but also nature and disarray and things not being quite right and trying to kind of find peace within the world, even if things just aren't fitting together. And so you have these compositions that bring together electronic elements, that bring together strained instrumental choices, that play around with texture and timbre a lot and do things that just don't quite work. But in the process of not quite working are arresting and beautiful and very successful and satisfying as music, especially like in the early part of the record as well with tracks like Andante, which is this incredibly mournful piece that is much more akin to some of his earlier work. But then you go into a song like Disintegration after that, which is just this incredibly dissonant piano experiment that feels kind of painful to listen to because of how amelodic it is in a conventional sense. And from there, he just goes through these increasingly more abstract and bizarre exercises that I find really fascinating and really enjoyable. And they don't always work necessarily. There is a piece later in this record, which is just essentially a um, kind of just three people each playing a triangle and trying to play it as mechanically as possible. And they're kind of like playing off each other with their triangles, but eventually they just clash and just start making like these really unpleasant clashing triangle tones. And it becomes this really kind of, it's just wrong piece of music. And I'm not sure it works. Triangle jam band. I'm not sure it works. It's certainly not pleasant to listen to, but it's intriguing as an exercise. And there's also a, the title track on here as well. We are, uh, Sakamoto arranges these this little string quartet, but he arranges them to play these really dissonant arrangements and to use pizzicato techniques, which is when you have um, when you kind of just pluck the strings and play them really, really shrill in a really, really shrill way. Like what it's what Radiohead did on Burn the Witch, essentially. And you have these, you know, these plucked, picked strings that are happening and they sound really eerie. And there are points in this record where I literally had a physical reaction to a sound that Sakamoto was creating. Uh, it's not always this unpleasant. There's moments of sheer beauty on this as well that I found to be really, really lovely and warm. But so much of the record is about this discomfort. And I think it's really bold and interesting that Sakamoto spent so much time and crafted this record to really exp explore that space. And so even when it doesn't work, I'm always intrigued by it. And I think it's a really, really strong release that anyone who likes Sakamoto and wants to get a little bit more into what he's been doing compositionally in the later part of his career should absolutely give this record a try. There were lots of moments where it reminded me actually of Bjork's Biophilia. And that's a record where she similarly is working with these really obviously electronic, but just like these sparse and minimalist and really tactile sounds. And she's making these sort of not very, not necessarily conventionally satisfying or, uh, where the arrangements are dictated by some natural force, essentially, as opposed to, you know, normal musical progression. She's essentially surrendering her compositional whims to forces like the moon's gravity or whatever, you know, the crazy shit she did on that. And Sakamoto feels like he's doing kind of similar thing here. So if you enjoy that side of an artist like Björk, you might enjoy this side of Sakamoto, which brings me to his most recent release, uh, 12, uh, named for the number of pieces on it, each of which was composed at a, on a particular day in between October of 2021 and April of 2022. Now, the album is almost completely sequenced chronologically, except for the last song, which is, um, I think, moved out of chronology so that it ends the record in a more fitting way, I suppose, for what Sakamoto wanted. But yeah, these are essentially entirely improvised, 
or at least partially improvised. Actually, I don't know that they're entirely improvised, but these are pieces that Sakamoto worked on and recorded very much in a sense, trying to capture a feeling without kind of over composing it in any way. So they're very minimalist pieces. Um, a lot of it is exploring synthesizer tones. Some of it is, is exploring piano tones and some of the more uh, organic instrumentation and some of it is purely electronic it is an exploration of various different tones that is an attempt for sakamoto again kind of like with async but the goal here feels a little bit more singular uh than that because that's about trying to explore you know discomfort and disarray in all these different ways whereas here that record feels tense, right? That record feels as though Sakamoto is struggling to process, you know, the, the changes that have happened in his life and the cancer diagnosis that he has. Whereas this new album, it feels like a kind of acceptance. You know, Sakamoto, from what I've read in interviews at the very least and from what I get out of this music, seems to be at a point now where he has essentially accepted his fate and is basically just grateful for any day where he gets to exist to make music, you know? And that's why I think it's the, the tracks are named after the days in which they were recorded, because that's what it's all about for him at this point is essentially, this is a day where I was alive and I made music and that's it really. There's no, you know, you could find, I mean, to me it's profound, but it's not like trying to be profound. You know, it is just, it's profound in its simplicity you know, this is a day that I lived, that I was breathing, and that I made music. And it's a document of days that he existed, that he lived, that he made music, knowing that he could have no certainty whether it would be the last or not. And that's, you know, obviously something that we all live with. We don't know when we're going to die, if we're going to die, you know, today or tomorrow or whenever. You know, that's the way that you have to live. But for Sakamoto, who obviously being in stage four of cancer is so heightened in his awareness of the time he has left. You know, it it's more pronounced. It's, it's a thing that seeps into everything he does. And here he's found a way, or it seems as though he's found a way to make a kind of peace with that and to find a kind of beauty in that. And that idea that any day could be the last. So each day feels meaningful. And similarly, I think the pieces here are some of the most straightforward that I've heard from Sakamoto. There's not a lot of dissonance or conflicting emotion in these pieces. Some of them are just very pointedly static for five or six minutes at a time. Like a, a few of them, especially early on, uh, the first half of the record is particularly languorous in this way, where he'll just be kind of sitting at a piano or at a synthesizer, and he'll just be hitting notes and kind of letting the timbres ring out and you know, exploring the relationship between sounds and all that sort of stuff. And you hear him breathing as he's doing this. Um, I don't know if that was a purposeful decision in terms of the way the mics were set up, but it seems, you know, I, Sakamoto is a composer, so I assume it to be purposeful. It's certainly not something that is as active an element of other um, recordings that he's done at a piano and released. So the breathing is just such an active part of these pieces. And it's every single breath is, is like another reminder as well, that this is a person who is alive at this moment, making this sound happen. And it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's really affecting. It's really, um, you know, I don't want to use right words like powerful or whatever, but it, it does, it has a power to it. Um, these aren't particularly complex pieces. Like I said, a lot of them are very static. Uh, many of them explore a single idea and kind of just don't even really explore that idea as much as just kind of sit in it um, for a period of time. Um, so, you know, it's not necessarily one of Sakamoto's most compositionally accomplished records and you know it's not trying to be it is purely a celebration of the ability to make sound uh while sort of enshrouded in death essentially and um i don't know thematically you know i can't know what the intent is or how some sakamoto was feeling 
when composing and performing these pieces. But to me, that I feel acceptance in this. When I listen to this music, I don't feel sadness. I don't feel a sense of, you know, a person who feels robbed of time or anything like that. I feel a gratitude that comes through in the music itself. And that's kind of paralleled by my own gratitude that it even exists and that I get to hear it. Um, yeah, I mean, is there any, what, what do you guys think of this um, very low key release? I mean, how did it make you feel to hear these pieces from Sakamoto and this very uh, incredibly stripped back style? I haven't had a lot of time this week. Uh, uh, I th I've only listened to this all the way through once. And I think maybe the first half, two or three times, just while getting other stuff done. But Sakamoto is certainly my favorite living composer. He's at a really interesting place in his career, I think. I almost think of it like him and Scorsese are like in the same spots of their respective careers and the progression that they've had thus far, which is just huge significant bodies of work produced up until now and at this point they are basically just indulging their own whims irrespective of you know pretty much anyone else and you're either on board for that or you're not and you know most people who are fans of Scorsese or Sakamoto are pretty well in at this point mm. um and i'm i'm certainly in structurally or you know holistically and stuff i wouldn't say this is as good as async or any of his collaborations with alvin noto on reun and Insen. it reminds me a lot of when nick cave would talk about his process with Warren Ellis on making Skeleton Tree and in particular Ghostine where the two of them would basically just play until something interesting happened and this sort of feels like that to me uh, these are the interesting things that happened while Sakamoto was just writing music and I find myself in a very similar emotional state listening to it as i did with ghosting just specifically the ghosting instrumentals the lyrics obviously add a whole other dimension to that yeah i, th I find it really fascinating and peaceful but also strangely emotionally cathartic so yeah I i'm certainly not anywhere close to unpacking all of my thoughts on this particular outing, but I, I am really, really digging it. I like that Scorsese comp just because, you know, his last two films, and from what I can gather, his next one, they kind of feel like tone poems about mortality, you know, in very different ways, but that's a prevailing theme in both Silence and The Irishman, you know, and, and, looking at that and how Scorsese views that and his relationship to it at this point in his life and async and 12 are both a similar sort of thing right they're reflections on mortality from two different perspectives like silence for Scorsese is about how his feelings about mortality relate to his relationship with faith and then Irishman's about how his feelings about mortality relate to his relationship with legacy right and then Asyncs about how Sakamoto's feelings about mortality relate to, you know, acceptance of death or lack of acceptance or how painful it feels. And then 12 is, to me at least, uh, finding a resolution in that. Um, Jake August, what do you guys think? Yeah, I'm, I'm in a bit of an interesting uh, space with this in that I, I think the the project here obviously does have some very apparent and very self-imposed limitations, be they uh, technical or uh, 
compositionally, but I, I think as the point has already so uh, dutifully been made that if you are into the narrative of Ryuichi Sakamoto as a musician, uh, this is a must listen. I I can imagine, and I'm just going to say, I think if you're someone who doesn't really care it's this is not going to do a ton for you because a lot of this i find the emotion i'm getting out of it is is from the the context uh that's a part of this so that's a at least i think a disclaimer that needs to be uh, uh put out there but regardless i still do think that there are a lot of really standout uh moments on here in particular the third track i forget what it is specifically but that's really when the the breathing starts to become really pronounced and what i really love about the breathing on this album is it gives a real sense of atmosphere and and i guess uh just place to this album in a way where you feel like you could just be inches away from Sakamoto able to hear his breath as he's he's playing these songs so I think I think the intimacy to it is a huge part of why this works uh but yeah generally I'm enjoying it I'm enjoying what I've heard of it I I'd have to ruminate on it a bit longer to see where I I really come down on it but I think this is a a worthwhile release for Sakamoto devotees although you already know that if you're a Sakamoto devotee I'd think I'd say as an like just as an album of music it's a bit of a mixed bag for me the moments I find the most compelling on here are honestly the moments that are the most minimal that have the least going on in it, just because I feel like you're able to appreciate the raw compositional elements a little bit more just easily, I guess. And when you have moments like the the second track going from the third track, you sort of have those compressed breathing that's in there at first that gets like, it's very quiet in the one track. And then in the track following, it becomes a whole lot louder. And I really like how that's sort of a taken variable that's expounded upon in the track list. And it makes some moments like the first, I'd say third of this to be really interesting. That's when I think the album is kind of at its best. When there are moments that are a little bit more heavy on the like electronic elements and synthesizer stuff, like the first track, for instance, I think is a great example of this working super duper well. I really like that track a lot. But then there's stuff like the fifth and sixth track, which honestly don't do a whole lot for me. I find some of the more ele heavy electronic stuff a bit overbearing for what this project feels like it's going for emotionally. And that leads me to be holistically a little bit more mixed on the raw sonic elements of it but when it comes to like an emotional experience the highlights of this album are as great and as engaging and as emotional as you all have said they feel very exploratory they feel mournful but also full of a kind of acceptance and there's just there's so much happening in songs that you naturally wouldn't put a whole lot of thought into like on first listen but you get that context of what's going on here and those more minimal moments just feel like they have there's an infinite waiting pool of artistic emotions ambitions and all this stuff that leads to a very emotionally engaging experience that i occasionally kind of tune out of just because of some of the musical elements but i would still say that this is overall an experience that i found highly rewarding as a fan of sakamoto's work and again that this is just this is such an an album that is dependent on so many other variables that aren't the music at play here so it's really just a matter of what you come with into this experience and what not just what you get out of it but what you're willing to get out of it you can put a lot into a listening experience like this and I feel like you can get a lot out of it but simultaneously if you're not willing to put in that kind of work to add that context yourself to to do a little bit of digging and exploring and find out how you feel about all of this all of these experiences then 
maybe this won't exactly, you know, be a home run hit for you. I, I would say that certainly you would start elsewhere with Sakamoto's work. Like even stuff like the Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence soundtrack is probably a place where you would be more inclined to discover more of his work from here on out. So this this highly depends on you as a listener. And if you're not ready for an experience like that, I would say that that this is probably not something I would actively seek out. One thing that just occurred to me, um, thinking about that that kind of prevailing element of Sakamoto in performance, you know, and that's one. Is it an element that I like about a lot of his sort of solo piano stuff? Is the the, you know obviously it's recorded live but he goes above and beyond in the way he records to give it a live feeling like a feeling of just you know art kind of tumbling out of someone um but the breathing stuff you know that the 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 miking of that and the presence of his breathing in these piano pieces it feels almost like you know between the piano notes themselves this, you know, this beauty that comes from his mind and the breathing, you know, the, the necessity of, of life to be able to create that. Yeah, you get this sense of the mind at will at war with the body or the body at war with the mind, essentially. The mind uh, having to fight the body to be able to continue to create. And, you know, the body's presence being this thing that hangs over it as this limitation or this thing that has to be bested, uh, confronted, dealt with in order to create. And that I think is the most profound thing about the record is how it makes you think about, be aware of that. You know, this is a, not even specific to Sakamoto himself, just in general, it makes you think about that. Obviously the relationship between our physical forms, our bodies and our minds and how we are reliant on one to be able to use the other essentially. And that's a thing that um, is quite profound the way that he makes you aware of that and amongst this performance and gets you to dwell on that. And I enjoy that aspect of it a lot. So yeah, I would say this is uh, essential Sakamoto. If like Jake, I agree, it may not be a particularly friendly entry point into his stuff because of the weight of it all. Um, I do think it's essential for his oeuvre. Alrighty. Well, that wraps up our reviews of music new and old this week. Now we're going to get into our main discussion topic of the day, which is talking about lyrics. We've talked a lot about music, especially with Sakamoto talking about composition, all that sort of stuff. Let's talk about the other side of the fence. Let's talk about songwriting and lyric writing in particular. What do we look for in it? What do we attach to the most? What do we like the most? And what lyricists, writers have informed our taste in music the most? That's going to be our topic for today. And as I mentioned at the top of the episode, uh, the three of us have each picked two lyricists, one who's kind of most predominant, uh, significant and recognized work exists and was written in the 20th century in the sort of 70s, 80s or 90s, and one who predominant work has come about in the last 20 years in particular um and we kind of impose that as a way of forcing ourselves to look at what we enjoy in lyricism and songwriting from more than just one perspective essentially um so i think the the, the best way to do this is if we each start with our kind of classical or 20th century pick and sort of cycle around and then do our modern day picks as well so jake why don't you lead us off with your pick for favorite lyricist of the 20th century well you followed this podcast follow me the most expected pick of all time here and really i tried to think of somebody who wasn't this person that i could talk about but the more and more people i thought of that could theoretically occupy this spot the more I just felt dishonest with myself and the more I just had to go with, of course, the one and only Tom Waits. 
And we've talked extensively about Tom Waits on this show. And honestly, that makes for some of the best content I think we've ever made. Uh, us talking about Bone Machine, us talking about Mule Variations, um, my video on his entire discography. If you want more in-depth uh, goings about Mr. Waits's work, we have that for you in spades. But I wanted to focus a little bit on maybe some of his earlier stuff, because not only is that a little bit more singer songwriter oriented it more focuses on tom himself and it's interesting picking him as well because there's so much to what makes tom Waits special that isn't his songwriting when it comes to him as a musical mind as a pure raw musician um when it comes to instrumentation when it comes to composition when it comes to the art of performance all of these things are key to understanding him, but his lyricism is probably, I think, the most deeply embedded and valuable quality that he has as an artist. And as early on as something like Closing Time, his debut, I feel like the best quality I can sort of ascribe to Tom to describe what my, like, why I gravitate towards him, why people gravitate towards him, is that he is a storyteller. All of his songs, they, they feel elusive in a way that is innately compelling there there is something about them that feels channeled from the ether not necessarily like it, it's almost opposite of why you find a lot of other songwriters a lot of uh instances that we will talk about including my other pick here is that tom's special because it feels like his songwriting is almost impersonal he's able to kind of distance himself and channel something that i feel like not a lot of people are able to specifically tune into but still do it with a specific emotional intensity that feels honest that feels raw that feels like you're not sacrificing in doing something uh for channeling into that and i think one of the best examples of that is on one of his earlier albums, which I've in the past talked about the fact that I prefer the second half of Tom's career because I like the more adventurous sonic detours and genres that he explores. Um, but a lot of what makes him a foundational songwriting mind, in my opinion, is in that first half. And even on albums that I would consider far less essential. But I think the quintessential Tom Waits song, in my opinion, is from the album Blue Valentine, that being Kentucky Avenue. Oh, um, so this glad song, you said that one. Oh. Right? Like, I, I feel like I've talked about this song in reference to other Tom Waits songs, because in many respects, I consider this to be the blueprint for his storytelling style. I mean, from the outset, the opening set of lyrics here are Eddie Grace's Buick got four bullet holes in the side. Charlie Delisle is sitting at the top of an avocado of an avocado tree. Mrs. Storm will stab you with a steak knife if you step on her lawn. I got half a pack of Lucky Strikes, man, so come along with me. And so many Tom Waits isms are embedded into the first set of lyrics here. You have the, you know, making up names that are, you know, of characters who, you know, are never going to appear in anything ever again, but they add a certain, you know, kind of regional specificity to what he's talking about. Details like the bullets uh, in the back of a, of a Buick or, or just like the area, the environment in which these specific details are lended credence. There's nothing that flows about these details from a traditional standpoint, but they create such a vivid picture in your mind. And it almost feels like that vivid picture is not going to look like anyone else's vivid picture of what this is, which is, again, a lot of what makes him special is that there is a specificity to his lyricism, but there's also a malleability to it, to where you could hear these lyrics, but you can feel something completely different from these images than somebody else can. And a lot of what makes this song special is that it just manages to keep iterating upon these ideas where it's just kind of a list of these tangential images, these tangential sensory experiences. And it makes something that's so palpable uh, out of it. Um, stuff like, um, and we'll break all the windows in the old Anderson place. We'll steal a bunch of boysenberries and smear them on your face. I'll get a dollar from my mama's purse by that skull and crossbones ring, and you can wear it around your neck on an old piece of string. All of these tiny little items, details, 
actions, all of them feel so vital, so in the moment, and they all conjure up this one idea of Tom Waits taking this person or this character that he's playing, taking another character in this song and basically guiding them through their life and where they live and having this incredibly emotional experience that's simultaneously really special to them and closely held. But also there's nothing that's particularly like, you know, wild or off the beaten path about this. This is just another day in this person's life. And then there's uh, the, the, the set of lyrics that I think I get the most from is I'll take the spokes from you, your wheelchair and a magpie's wings and I'll tie them to your shoulders and your feet. I'll steal a hacksaw from my dad, cut the braces off your legs and we'll bury them tonight out in the cornfield. You just get this feeling of raw liberation, taking away these constraints that confine you from something and then liberating you subsequently from it. It almost feels like this is a microcosm for Tom's entire ethos as a storyteller, as a performer, as an and as an artist, is that his lyrical style, his songwriting, his performances, they liberate you from the confines of what you traditionally know as songwriting and art and storytelling and show you something new and something different, but with familiar elements that never allow you to feel alienated or or distant from his work is what keeps a cohesion to all of this even when there is no cohesiveness to stuff like the vast majority of this song in keeping with that really my pick for a, a more classic songwriter is none other than nick cave it does feel a little bit like cheating that this is my more classic pick uh considering that most of my favorite writing of his has been in the past 10 years. But, you know, it's not like that's when he got good or anything. Um, <laughs> through pretty much every step of his career, uh, whether it be with The Birthday Party or The Bad Seeds or just with Warren Ellis, there's even been something lyrical in the way that he writes the music just in the way that it sounds but specifically i don't think anyone is able to evoke such literary feelings i guess in music in the same way that cave is a lot of it will strike you right in the heart immediately but part of what is so great about it is that so much of cave's writing feels like you're reading Faulkner or something like that, something as mm -hmm. rewarding and sometimes as challenging as that. I, I mean, one of the great hallmarks of any writer is you can read their words and pretty much immediately nail down who is writing. But yeah, I mean, I just, I'm looking at Stagger Lee right now. And he's like, he said, Mr. Motherfucker, you know who I am. And the barkeep said no, and I don't give a good goddamn. And I'm like, <laughs> if that is anybody other than Nick Cave, I'm cutting off a foot. <laughs> but equally so, in the pretty much opposite end of his spectrum, with one of probably the most famous opening lines on any album and any song, I don't believe in an interventionist God, but I know, darling, that you do. <sighs> That's the fucking man right there, man. Nick is like... The kind of artist, the kind of writer who, once you form a connection with any guys of what he has done, and he's written, his writing has changed so much while staying so much the same across his like 40, 50 year career. You know, from those early days of these just vicious and bloody and brutal american gothic storytelling exercises that he did on records like tender prey and murder ballads to this later era of his career where you know religion and faith have kind of been a theme that he's toyed with um, throughout his career but they've become much more front and center um in basically everything that he's done this century i think and he is an artist who captures that 
you know, visceral chaos of youth and of trying to reconcile all the overwhelming urges and emotions and experiences that you don't know how to reconcile in your early years, but it also captures the older wizened perspective of the person who has shared those things to some extent, or has found a way to put them to bed and has found a kind of peace and communing with something that is more corporeal, I guess. I don't know. It's really hard to explain what makes Nick so powerful as a writer throughout his career, but he always has this ability to feel timeless and also has this ability to kind of transcend typical songwriter interests and fears and, and, and um, to, to feel as though he's channeling some kind of divine force, but he's so painfully human as well. He's so painfully little and just, you know, vulnerable and no better than any of us but yet he feels as though he's a vessel for each of us to kind of like commune with or capture or engage with, you know, something beyond our awareness and existence and our lives, essentially. Like he is, he, he's transcendent in that way. You know, he, he's, he's very human. He's very much like you and me. And he's also someone who's able to, I guess, communicate or tangibly like get across some understanding or some awareness of like how unknowable the universe is and make that feel as though it's something that you understand, even if you don't really understand it or you couldn't understand it. Things like death and grief and uh, the afterlife and, you know, all the finality of mortality, all those things, he makes them easier to approach and think about and less scary, which is one of the most, you know, amazing things any songwriter can do. One of the hardest things any songwriter can do. Um, and he's able to make death less scary in different ways. Like on murder ballads, death is this kind of like, you know, this it's ridiculous. It's this kind of fate that we're all consigned to. Yeah, exactly. Whereas on Ghostine, it is this, you know, this beautiful transmission, essentially. So he he has viewed death in different ways throughout his career. And in all of those different guises, it becomes something more human and more approachable and more real. And that, I think, is why he's so resonant and why it's so easy to connect with him and kind of turn to him as a point of comfort when forces outside of your control or the universe or whatever starts to feel overwhelming he's just good at that right well my first pick my pick for 20th century writer is mr michael stipe um chief creative visionary lyricist vocalist behind the legendary american rock band rem and stipe is you know more so even than weights or cave like a difficult artist to explain the appeal of or even like the point of just to be a little bit more blunt i know that you know uh it's reductive to say that any writer or artist has a point um to their work or a reason for it but stipe is someone who listening to his music and listening to the music of rem and and especially being captivated by his words and his phenomenal voice as well from a very young age he's someone that i feel like i learned about the world through there's just something in the way he writes and particularly in those early days but it changes as well through in the 90s um like the thing about early rem kind of the the gimmick and the bit is that uh, michael's kind of unintelligible and you can't kind of understand what he's saying because of the way that he sings. And then when you sit down with the lyric sheet, you realize it reads all like gibberish anyway, but it's very evocative. Like one of my favorite REM songs is Gardening at Night off of the Chronic Town EP. And I don't claim to have a single clue what this song is about at all. 
Stipe described it as basically the first song we ever really did. And to me, it evokes youth. It evokes a kind of childhood, innocent, naive view of the world, like a view of only what is right in front of you. Um, there's l lyrical passages in this. I see your money on the floor. I felt the pocket change through all the feelings that broke through that door. just didn't seem to be real. The yard is nothing but a fence. The sun just hurts my eyes. Somewhere it must be time for penitence. Gardening at night is never weir. And gardening at night just didn't grow. And like, it's very surreal and you kind of, it's kind of fragmentary and imagistic as opposed to directly communicating any kind of story. But it makes me feel like a kid who's like four or five years old and just kind of stumbling around the yard and everything being kind of big and incomprehensible and amorphous. And from those early days where I feel like Michael was able to communicate these, you know, kind of the hugeness and the unknowability of the world um, and your place in the world as well, like just being with the the struggle between just kind of being a functional cog in the world, which comes through in songs like Driver 8 off of Fables of the Reconstruction, which I think is one of um, his greatest songs. Lyrically, that whole thing about um, he's this this passenger train driver essentially whose life is just completely revolves around this simple single functional path that they have to take and the you know the the aspects of that path that they memorize that they describe the things that they see day in day out and the way in which that is their vessel to humanity uh, as well as being you know the the thing that they have to do uh it's a really potent and powerful song and that you know brushing up against something that is more immediately emotional and speaking of a different kind of isolation to the isolation you feel in your job or in your place in the world uh like so central rain which is just you know half of the song is just stipe singing i'm sorry at the top of his voice over and over and over again but there's these beautiful lines did you never call i waited for your call these rivers of suggestion are driving me away the ocean sang the conversations dimmed go build yourself another dream this choice isn't mine just these really conflicted and almost kind of angry or aggressive rebuffs and refrains against someone else and this sense of tension and clashing between two people um, every aspect of growing up and feeling a sense of confusion or isolation or an inability to communicate or understand uh, someone else or some wider force around you is something that stipes writing in the 80s like really i never understood it directly especially as a kid but i felt it uh, and then you move into the 90s in particular as well. And Stipe has grown up more and more and he's been through a lot more shit and his concerns are less, you know, they're they're more grandiose, I suppose, or, or he's experienced more death, for instance. You know what I mean? Like on Automatic for the People, there's, a, you know, there's actually a, a number of songs on that record that are really about, you know, confronting death and dying and grieving in ways that are, that feel like so much more wizened than the, the confusion and the angst of the early, early records. Like one of my absolute favorite REM songs is try not to breathe, which is essentially him like just describing the, you know, his grandmother's dying thoughts essentially. And just try her just trying to basically convince the, grieving family around her that, that they just need to let her go essentially and that she is happy to go and that she has made peace with that decision and speaking from that perspective as well of someone who is encouraging the people around them to just let them go and that it's okay to die yeah that's that you know automatic for the people in a weird way is like one of the first records i think that ever really taught me about death in any kind of way you know and sweetness follows as well is another song that does that from the you know sort of postpartum perspective as well like the the tensions that can arise after losing someone and the danger of getting lost within the grief in a way that 
you, where you let it tear you apart and where you let it tear you away from the people who are around you and the people that do exist. And all of that record to me, like so much of it is then recontextualized by the death of Kurt Cobain as well, who, you know, famously was like listening to this record in his last days uh, and was a huge fan. And Michael wrote a lot of songs for him. And then on Monster, you have Let Me In, which is a song that he specifically wrote about Kurt's passing, like at the time that it happened and the way that it made him feel. And yeah, it's it's hard for me to encapsulate and kind of reductively bring down what I love about Michael Stipe as a writer across the years. But when I need someone to turn to, to kind of make sense of the just insane mess of existence, sometimes having someone, even if you don't understand what on earth they're saying or what on earth they're writing about, there's just someone who can make it feel like it doesn't matter or like it's not so scary. And Michael Stipe is one of those for me. Just an incredible performer, an incredible writer, absolutely my favorite lyricist of the uh, 20th century. And Dr- Driver 8, in, in particular, just as an aside, actually covered by somebody who will make a mention on this list a little bit later. Who oh, sh- certainly, I think, is a bit of a kindred spirit with Stipe in a lot of ways. Yes, indeed. Right. Well, let's circle back around to you, Jake, for your modern day 21st century pick for your favorite lyricist. My favorite lyricist of, of all time, it, honestly, uh, uh, time period irrespective, is Scott Hutchinson of Frightened Rabbit. Thing is, is that this discography and even some of the stuff that Scott did uh, outside of the Frightened Rabbit discography, um, stuff like Master System and Owl John, all of these are facets worth exploring because of Scott's abilities as a songwriter. And not to mention the fact that I just, again, respond to a lot of the lyrical content and a lot of the lyricism that he puts out like any great songwriter. But this man knew his way around an incredible song hook. This man knew not just how to write great indie folk songs and like, again, lyrical, more literate, interesting works that people like us gravitate towards. He knew how to construct a song so that it would get stuck in your head like a traditionally great pop songwriter would. And he marries these sensibilities better than basically anybody who I think has ever lived, in my opinion. It's what makes going back to every Frightened Rabbit release a a joyous, as much as listening to this music can be, a joyous experience. And that is something, too, that I want to touch on, is that it's very easy to associate Scott and Frightened Rabbit's music with sadness with being dour and duly so i mean like i i get it It, it, a lot of it deals with very dark uh subject material and subject material that is undoubtedly colored by the unfortunate reality that we live in after scott's passing but i want to refer back to something that sersha said in our frightened rabbit episode which is it's easy to forget how deeply hopeful all of this lyricism is about how all of this is not about succumbing to your demons, but fighting them. And that's what makes it so emotionally poignant and potent. And for an example of Scott's wonderful lyricism, which I do think we do a great job in unpacking in our discography uh, episode on this band that you should check out if you haven't seen and you're interested in the band. But the example of Scott's songwriting I wanted to use is from an album that recently turned 10. uh, And I think we all kind of agreed is basically Scott's crowning lyrical achievement as like a raw songwriter that being pedestrian verse this is an album that i feel like just eternally i'm just retroactively upset that more people don't love it for the masterpiece that it is i'm that way with a lot of frightened rabbit stuff but this one in particular because it feels primed to be loved by more people 
Uh, and this song, I think, is a great example. Why? That being uh, not my favorite song on here, as I think the best example of Scott's songwriting is undoubtedly State Hospital. But Riley did such a fantastic job of unpacking State Hospital, which I don't know if it's still your favorite Frightened Rabbit song, but it, it was is. at the time. Uh, and you did a phenomenal job of unpacking it. I mean, easily top three from this band. Uh, but the other song on here, and really, I could use any song on this album for the record. I mean, the opener acts of man, I think is maybe one of the best treatises on misogyny. That's basically ever been not written. Here, uh, not here. My other sort of sleeper hit for this album is the closer, the oil slick. This song tonally instrumentally is not exactly like it's a little bit more upbeat. It's a little bit brighter compared to some of frightened rabbit stuff. But then you take a look at the lyricism and this ends up being, I think, what is the most upsetting song on this album? Uh, the opening lines are, I went looking for a song for you, something soft and patient to reflect its muse. I took a walk with my brightest thought, my brightest thoughts, but the weather soon turned and they ran off. And you can kind of infer from these opening lines that this song is probably the most personal on here. It's pedestrian verse is an album that's entirely about other characters besides Scott. He includes himself frequently, but he is kind of venturing out storytelling wise on this record. And I think it's why it's sort of the, the his greatest accomplishment is that it's the most ambitious thing he made. But here, this is very much about his process as a songwriter and as a lyricist and as an artist and even as a performer. He's got uh, the lines took to the ocean in a boat this time only an idiot would swim through the shit that I write how can I talk of light and warmth I've got a voice like a gutter in a toxic storm which paints more of a picture of what Scott probably thought of himself instead of how many people see him but it shows you how modest of a presence he was and I do actually think Scott has a beautiful singing voice in its own way, but it shows this self-conscious attempt to just sort of be like, how can I talk about these emotional multifaceted things? How can I, can I talk about these things when it's so not reflective of who I am as a person he feels, even though I feel like it's sort of, you know, there's just this self-evident struggle to reckon with who he really is and who he's perceived as on a song like this. Uh, and then there's the, the the passage that gets me the most, which is all the dark words pouring from my throat sound like an oil slick coating the wings we've grown. There goes a love song drifting out to sea. I'd sing along if I could hear it. It's like he's talking actively about the opportunities that he's missed and the songs that he hasn't quite captured or, or written that have sort of passed him by on a creative whim and what he's gravitated towards versus what inspires him. And there's just such a depth to the process of being a songwriter on a song like this. The ending passage here, there is light, but there's a tunnel to crawl through. There is love, but it's misery loves you. There's still hope, so I think we'll be fine in these disastrous times, disastrous times. There's such a great meter to his words on here. There's such a great presence of the enormity of existence and trying to capture that in song form. And there's always a sense that Scott does his best but in the most flawed way possible there's this jagged almost perverse way that he captures all of these images a lot of scott's writing is reminiscent of body horror there's lots of really grotesque images that he conjures for as far back as the midnight organ fight you know uh the his organs disappearing in scottish rain like on the the opener of that album and there's just there's such a specificity to his identity as a songwriter that it feels like he shouldn't be able to capture the enormity of these experiences and emotions. But he always does. There, There's that specificity is, in fact, what makes its words special and beautiful and what make them speak to a lot of people, I feel uh, myself, especially, is that there is a sort of presence of being able to sort of 
capture a certain poetry that would be like on you know as written word would be as compelling as it is sung and and performed i feel like you can appreciate stuff like pedestrian verse as works of poetry as strongly as you can uh works of song i feel like state hospital is one of the best examples of that and he's just the writer who i feel like captures the human experience the best so what better choice could i make for my favorite songwriter than him his um scott's favorite song that he ever wrote at least at the last point in i almost time, chose this at least at the last point in time at which he was asked this question is the song things off of um the winter of mixed drinks and that song i think really encapsulates what makes him so affecting as a performer as well as any i think um and as a writer as well Everything that Scott writes about is a as an attempt to, if not escape, then to transcend the trappings of both the body and the mind, essentially, that have also given him the ability to express all of these things. And there is a desire for freedom from constraint that is, you know, at its heart the most universal feeling that you could possibly express that agency, that need for ownership of yourself that comes through in everything. And all of his writing boils back down to that desire for not only freedom, but also comfort in yourself that Scott so desperately struggled for and fought for his entire life morgan your pick for 21st century songwriter that stands out the most to you and why yeah i mean another one that you could probably see coming a million miles away if you know anything about me or any of us um it's none other than mr jason isbel it, it feels so rare to be able to hear someone like this within this particular realm of songwriting operate in their prime as it's happening. That certainly is part of the relationship that I have with Isbel as a writer, um, is not just that he's as good as he is, but that it's all happening now and it feels relevant and urgent and pertinent basically no matter what he's saying but to put it as bluntly as possible the guy just knows how to cut me right down to it maybe my favorite song of his it's it's diff it's hard to tell but maybe one of my favorite songs of his uh is the closing track on the album that is also celebrating its 10th anniversary this year um which I think we're invariably going to have to cover when that hundred uh, percent. Oh yeah, month comes around. Yeah, the clothes are on that relatively easy. Um, yeah, I mean the the lines that hit me hardest are, "I lost a good friend Christmas time when folks go off the deep end. This woman took the kids and he took clonopin enough to kill a man of twice his size." Not for me to understand and remember him when he was still a proud man. Vandal's smile, the baseball in his right hand. Nothing but the blue sky in his eye. Which is a, a line, or a, a set of lines that I are like tattooed on the back of my eyelids. Uh, it, there's, there's so much there. Um, but I, I, something I don't think as we'll get enough credit for, even within his particular niche, is, I mean, obviously it's all over Twitter, but <laughs> that's sort of the nature of that particular beast, is uh, just how funny he can be. Um, oh, yeah. I, th I think of uh, the f the first few lines off of songs that she sang in the shower, also off of oh, Southeastern, God. which are on a lark, on the whim. I said, there's two kinds of men in this world, and you're neither of them. And his fist cut the smoke. I had an eighth of a second to wonder if he got the joke. Which <laughs> is just bars. And like that's that has got 
is is easily top five songs of mine about being a hopeless idiot. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the the man is the gift that keeps on giving, um, and I could sit here and bang on for another half hour at least about the various spots that I think he's written some of the greatest words that I've ever heard or read, but I mean, you get it. Absolutely. My second pick and our final discussion for the episode is um, John Daniel, the famous beloved singer songwriter and leader of the mountain goats. Now the mountain goats have had such a varied and dense career uh, artistic oeuvre that it would be a fool's errand to try and capture all of it and all of the different things that John writes about Um, in his most famous work he writes about the pain of growing up in a world that can't and won't accept you and the struggle for freedom from that the idea of escape in its many forms Uh, and records like All Hail West Texas, which we talked about uh, last year when it turned 20. We did a great record club on that. And, you know, and of course, famously talking about his childhood and his difficult relationship with his abusive stepfather on the sunset tree, the the emotions surrounding that and how he processed that as he grew up. Uh, A beloved record for, for many reasons. And into his more recent work as well, where he kind of, writes almost more in a kind of concept uh, record fashion where each album is sometimes strictly but more often loosely based around a particular topic or group of people or idea that allows for John to write more broadly about humanity through specific examples. I think records he does that particularly powerfully on include um, Beat the Champ and Last Year's Bleed Out. Um, But the album I want to focus on as an exemplar of his songwriting is my favorite Mountain Goats album. And the more time passes, as great as I think the Mountain Goats over is, and it is great, and there are many spectacular records, I only get more confident in this with time as my favorite Mountain Goats album. And it's 2009's The Life of the World to Come, where John essentially the structural technique i suppose is that each song is named for and loosely inspired by a particular bible passage and john's relationship with his christianity and his faith in general is an overarching theme in all of his writing to some degree but these aren't specifically texts about bible stories uh he takes a passage and uses it very loosely as inspiration for a reflection on human behavior on human instinct on not even just human actually, because you have a song on here like um, Deuteronomy 2.10 where John is essentially writing from the perspective of various animals throughout history who essentially are witness to the uncaring nature of time and of the universe itself and of human beings to a certain extent too. Um, And it's very powerful and it's very evocative. But John is able also here to write about these certain fundamental aspects of human interaction and selfishness and the way in which we understand ourselves through our attempts to understand other people. And I think so many of his most moving and elegant and gorgeous and affecting songwriting is here. Uh, in songs like Matthew 25, 21, for instance, where he talks about um, confronting uh, his mother-in-laws on her deathbed, essentially, and approaching that situation and and saying goodbye, but also being unable to say goodbye. And, you know, he has passages on that song like, um, you were a presence full of light upon this earth, and I'm a witness to your life and to its worth. It's three days later when I get the call and there's nobody around to break my fall. And he, he he describes his grieving process and his anticipation of grief and the language of, you know, an airplane tearing itself apart in the air and, and people screaming as the engines fail. And that's one of the more intense moments on that record as well. 
but there's also so many songs in this album that exist and still moments of reflection and mundanity for people whose lives are, you know, have no necessarily predictable direction of any kind. I always think a lot of this passage in Romans 10, 9, where he talks about, I wake up 60 minutes after my head hits the pillow. I can't live like this. And, and in the shower, I am a sailor standing, waiting, ready for the ship to list. You know, every morning when I wake up, I feel like that, um, you know, going to work and just starting your day. And that chorus of if you will believe in your heart and confess with your lips, surely you'll be saved one day. That idea of having to look for something to give it all meaning. You know, it's very fundamental human nature aspects of songwriting that John absolutely nails. You know, there's confronting death, you know, the unknowability of suicide as well in a song like Philippians 3, 20 to 21, where he talks about the sense of confusion and dissonance inside him when processing the suicide of someone in his life. The path to the awful room that no one will sleep in again was lit for one man only, gone where none can follow him. Try to look down the way he had gone, back of the closet whose depths go on and on. And nice people said he was with God now, safe in his arms. But the voices of the angels that he heard on his last days with us, smoke alarms. You know, stuff like that just it's this it's a difficult song because it's about how you reconcile and try to understand the loss of someone who chose to leave but also how unknowable that is and how unknowable other people's responses to it can be when you're so absorbed in your own experience of it and look it's hard to cherry pick examples here but i think that within this record life of the world to come i think everything that john is concerned with as a writer everything he's ever written about is distilled into these single moments of intense emotion or of simple observation that feel to me as though someone is able to communicate and put out into the world an understanding of everything of the unknowable that makes it all feel less scary and less alien you know it's the same sort of thing as what i was saying about nick cave before and michael stipe for a certain to a certain extent as well these are artists who are obviously human beings and don't have any special knowledge that any of the rest of us don't have but they do have an ability to make the scariness the fear the unknown the intangible feel as though it's something that isn't to be a, to, to be feared basically and that's what i love so much about john is that ultimately he's a human being and he's not in any, ever trying to disguise that in any way and nor is he ever trying to bullshit you into believing that some dark and difficult topic is somehow going to be easy to understand or all right in the end necessarily he just he gives you his perspective he gives you his view and he lets you sit with him in that space and see how you feel in that space. And it's a process that for me has made it easier for me to understand how I feel about these huge, massive, terrifying topics and how I want to look, continue to live the rest of my life, basically. And that's what's great about John. So this was an interesting exercise, I think. It can actually be really tough with your favorite songwriters and lyricists to actually put into words why they're so great. Because often one of the things about writing songs and one of the things about great songwriters is that what they're doing is, you know, it, it's a profound task. It's something that if it were easy to communicate, then anyone could do it, right? But these people have a special ability for us that makes the world a better place for them existing and makes life easier to live for knowing them. And that's why we love them. And we want to know from you at home as well, who are your favorite lyricists? Who are your favorite songwriters? Who are the people that have influenced the way you view the world the most? 
who feel as though they understand the world closest to how you understand it, who you get the most off out of their lyrics and out of their songwriting. Let us know in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of Jams and Tea now. If you enjoyed it, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel if you have not already. We do this every week and we'd love to continue having you along the way with us. Until next time though, folks, as always, rock over London, rock on Chicago, the Mosaic Company. We help the world grow the food it needs.